Good evening. This is your friend, Pastor McInerney from Bible Baptist Church, Savannah, with our weekend report going into the weekend of March 27th and 28th. And we'll be joining our Bible study here in just a few moments. But before that, let me share a couple quick announcements with you. This Saturday at 8 o'clock is our men's prayer meeting right here in Victory Hall. Each and every Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning, we meet as men of the church to pray for the needs of our families, our congregation, and our country. And certainly, our country has been through a lot these last few weeks with uh, mass shootings and violence and the needs on the border and the political uh, deadlocks that are going on in our ca capital. We really need prayer. And we ask that you would come and join us, fellas, guys, the teenage guys and up. Come on, 8 o'clock Saturday, and join us to pray for our church and for our country. And then Sunday is Palm Sunday, and we are excited about sharing the Lord's Supper, the communion service at 8 o'clock and 1030 a.m. We'll be doing it in both services in a very uh, safe and sanitary way. We have the prepackaged elements as we used a few months ago. The, the uh, bread and, and the cup are together, and the men will be passing them out individually. We won't be passing the trays, so you don't have to worry about safety in that regard. And we'll be closing each of those morning worship services with the Lord's Supper. So we want you to join us as we commemorate the cross of the Savior and the suffering of Christ for our sins. And uh, as that special service of the church represents the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that was take, uh, takes away the sins of the world. And then, parents, a special note, at 1030, there will be Children's Church for kindergarten and under, but first through fifth grade will be joining us in the auditorium so they can be with their family for this special uh, church ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And then next week is Easter, and we are very excited to have the Taylor family, special uh, national recording artists from North Carolina. They'll be with us at 8 o'clock and 1030. The special concert will be at 6 o'clock on Easter night, and uh, we've pushed that back from 5 o'clock, our normal service, so that you have a longer afternoon for your family gatherings and Easter events, and then come back and join us for that free concert. It is open to the public. You don't need a ticket. We want our community to come and enjoy this special night of celebrating our risen Savior. And the Taylors, again, a wonderful group from North Carolina, will be with us. Uh, in those morning services on Easter, we will have nursery and junior church available in both services so that you can choose either one of those that morning, 8 o'clock or 1030, for your family to come and worship on the Lord's Day. We serve a living Savior, and we're excited that Easter is here and that the church is open and uh, that we serve a living Savior that we can tell the world about the empty tomb. So come and join us on Easter Sunday, April 4th. And now I want to encourage you to stay with us as Associate Pastor Michael Finley continues our midweek Bible study on the marks of a mighty church. This is part four in the series. I know that you'll enjoy it. It'll be a blessing to you. And we'll see you soon, uh, hopefully this Sunday. God bless you. Good evening, church family. God, you're here with us on this Wednesday night. And I hope you had a, a, a wonderful day today. And we're encouraged that you're here with us tonight. Uh, and all the classes that are going, going on, the teen ministry, the children's ministry, thank you for joining us here online. Uh, we're going to be continuing our series, Marks of a Mighty Church, and uh, Comforting to the Servant of God. And so if you have your Bibles, turn them to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to spend uh, most of our time and then going through chapter 3 tonight. Uh, but if you think about postcards, what do you think of? I, I remember postcards as in going on vacation and uh, being at a certain souvenir shop, and they have the postcards that you can get and send um, to people. And I remember, you know, friends that would send them to their grandparents or they would send them to loved ones, uh, just kind of as, a, a, hey, this is where we were. Uh, but think about a letter. Think about a handwritten card that you send to someone and the encouragement that that brings. And Paul here in uh, 1 Thessalonians 2 is, is writing a letter to Thessalonica and he's writing as a concern. He's writing to them because he can't get to them. Satan has hindered him from coming. It's kind of a roadblock. And he's wanting to get there, but he can't. And so he sends Timothy uh, there in chapter 3 to, as a substitute uh, for him not being able to be there. But he's writing because he's a, a little uh, concerned about what they're going through, the persecution that they're dealing with. And so he's encouraged with the report that Timothy brings back to him. And so we're going to look at three things tonight. The first is this, Paul's anxiety for a mighty church. Paul's anxiety for a mighty church. Look at chapter 2, verse 17. It says, But we, brethren, 
being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our, our joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not, uh, are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And so we see this anxiety that takes, taking place. Again, Paul is kind of setting this up. He's in Corinth. He's writing a letter. We see there in, in the end of those verses that Satan has somehow hindered him. He has been trying to get there, trying to get back to Thessalonica. He's only been gone a short time, but he can't get back because Satan has hindered him in some way. And so when you look back at his, one of his first missionary journeys, when he first got to Thessalonica, this, this persecution takes place where he's being put down and people are going against him. And so now he is concerned for the people that he has taught and discipled and souls have been saved and, and people of the church. He's concerned for them. And so he's writing to them for that uh, very part of it. And if you look at verse 15, it, it kind of tells you a little bit about that persecution in, verse, in chapter 2. It says, We both killed the Lord Jesus and their own, uh, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us and they pleased not God and are contrary to all men. And you see that word persecuted. And so he's been, he understands that they have persecuted him and the church. And so with him being away, he's concerned for them. And so we see this expression that takes place there in verse 17. Paul loved this church. He loved the people. He had built relationships with them. And so he wanted to be back with them face to face, but he just couldn't get there. And so he had only been gone a short time again, like I said. But the two words, look at verse 17. He says the word endeavored. The word endeavored, it means to attempt by exerting effort. Now, many of us, some, some have a very labor-intensive job. And you exert a lot of energy or a lot of effort to get that job done. But then the next word is it says uh, for, more, for the more or the more abundantly. That word abundantly means a great plenty. And so putting those two words together means that there was no stone unturned. There was not lack of hard work or try or effort that he was trying to get back, but Satan continued to, sh to slow him down or to prevent him from getting where he wanted to go. And this type of relationship with the church, with how he loved his people, it's something that doesn't simply happen overnight. You can't fake this love. You can't fake this relationship. It's not by a flip of a switch. And I simply remember when, when me and Rachel first moved here and we were moving from Ohio, we left family to come here. And we've probably told this many times. And when we first got here, it was all new. It was all different. People uh, were encouraging to us and loved us, but it just didn't happen for us where we just fell in love. But over time, we've built those relationships. And this is what Paul is saying. Because of these personal relationships, this investment that he has made in the people and also the people have made into him have made it such the, so easy to love them. And this is why he's so concerned for them. He's so concerned for their, this persecution that's taking place. And it kind of reminds me, he didn't want them to fall away. It reminds me in Matthew chapter 13, the parable of the ground and the rocky ground. And the seed fell onto the rocky ground and uh, it found a little soil, it found a little place and it began to grow. But we will talk about this in a little bit. But those roots did not grow deep and they didn't have much to grab onto. And so once the sun came out and the rain stopped and the wind began to blow and we it soon realized that its roots were weak and didn't have anything to establish itself with, it withered and died. And I began to be, think about this separation. And in Sunday school, we talked about this separation that we have from God because of our sin in Isaiah 59 two. And when we have that separation, we need God to be there with us. And, and Paul has this feeling where he is separated from his church family. He's separated from his friends, from his, these people, these relationships that he's grown to love. Have you ever uh, been separated from a family member before for an extended period of time? Uh, I remember as a kid when uh, my mom would take me shopping. And I remember going to the mall and I remember uh, hiding inside the clothes racks and I remember one time I hid away thinking, uh, trying to play hide and go seek. And I remember popping out and I couldn't see my mom. And it kind of this scare took over. I also think of when we first moved here, we had lived here for a couple years. 
And we finally decided, after many people telling us uh, of how beautiful Hilton Head Island was, we decided to go. And so we went on a day, it was a Saturday, and we went to, we drove, and it was a beautiful day. And I can tell you this, I believe on this very day, every resident of the state of South Carolina decided to go to Hilton Head Beach. And we finally park, and we finally tote all of our stuff, and we finally get to the beach. And we're really, really far from the beach because there's so many people. And so me and Lola, as Rachel finished up setting up the chairs and the umbrella, uh, we walk to the ocean, and, and we're in the water, and we're kind of riding the waves, and she has her boogie board, and we're probably in there for about 20 minutes. And you know how the water is. As the waves kind of take you, you kind of just move down the beach and so finally, the weather kind of started to not be cooperating, and there was some thunder. And so the lifeguards called everybody out of the water. And I'm talking thousands of people were coming out of the water. And so as we walked up the beach, I soon realized that we were further down uh, than we, where we started. And so we started to walk down the beach. We started to look for Rachel and I remember thinking I would get so far and be like, man, this is too far. And I'd go back and I'd maybe go back a little bit further this time. And I, I was walking up and down the beach looking for Rachel, but I couldn't find her. And, and so what happened was the separation began to build some anxiety inside of me to the point where Lola began to see it and began to think, are we ever going to see mommy again? And eventually Long story short, over about a 30 to 35 minute period, we finally walk far enough. We finally find Rachel, uh, tears in her eyes. She had talk, been talking to the lifeguards and saying, uh, I, I don't know where my husband is. I don't know where my daughter is. And they use the words, well, let's fill out a missing persons report. So that really started to make Rachel nervous. But that separation that took place, she was anxious. I was anxious all because of the separation. And when we got back together, uh, you know, there was some re relief that took place. And Paul's thinking the same thing. This anxiety has overtaken him because he wants to be there with him. He, he wants to support them. He wants to help them through. And so this expression of Paul's concern, he's writing to them. He's saying, listen, I have put every effort forward to try and be there with you, but I, I just can't get there. And then we see the enemy of Paul, the enemy of, of Paul and the church or the converts there in verse 18, it says, wherefore we would have come unto you. We, we've, we've tried. And then moving on, it says, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us with great desire to see his church. He was doing everything he could to get there, to be with them, to love on them. But there's a roadblock. There's something that takes place where he can't get there. He can't love on his people. And so we know as Christians that we have an enemy, and that's Satan. That word uh, Satan means adversary. And he wants nothing more than to destroy us, to oppose us, to kind of take us down where we can't uh, do what God's calling us to do. He wants nothing more than just to simply uh, get rid of us. Satan is involved in a deadly war against Christians. It, it says it uh, in a very popular verse, 1 Peter 5.8. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. And so it says, be sober, be vigilant. And so we must never let our guard down. The word hindered uh, illustrates one of Satan's tactics. He puts roadblocks in our way so we can't do what God's called us to do. And it makes me think of a battle plan and having a, a spiritual battle plan to take on Satan. And it takes me back to my younger days when uh, we used to watch Home Alone. And Kevin made a battle plan. And there's a scene where he's got it all drawn, all the rooms in the house and all the different things that he's going to do. He's got this battle plan. The word hindered means to delay or prevent action. And it often goes to a military reference when it's talking about how a military uh, supply line has been hindered or destroyed. And we need to be prepared for an attack at all times. Be ready because Satan is actively waging war constantly, every day, every moment. He's waiting for us to let down our guard, to pull away a little bit so he can attack and he can full-fledged come after us. And you may think, well, uh, what, what can God do? What does God do or what does God give us uh, as tools or weapons for Satan to battle him? Well, it says in Ephesians 6, the 
armor of God. And it says put on the whole armor of God so we can be safe and it can help us. The belt of truth, the, shoe of pe- the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit. All of these things have to be in place. All of these things do we have to have in order for us to fulfill or have the weapons or um, to do what God's called us to do. And so we must be ready for an attack at all times. The next thing is the expectation of Paul's crown. Look in verse 19. It says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? And so we see here that that Paul is asking this rhetorical question. He's saying, um, for what is our hope? What is our joy? Where is our crown? And and Paul, uh, many times in the Bible, uses athletic events or um, athletic things to kind of explain Christianity or his walk or his run with the Lord. And he's talking about in those days how whenever someone would win a race or win an event, they would have a crown of leaves or a, or a wreath that would go around their neck, and it was to represent all the people uh, or to all people that they were the winner. And growing up, I know that for me, there's lots of uh, trophies that we, I won as a kid. And uh, now I think about those trophies that who really cares about that trophy when I was in second grade and I was playing for the Green Machine soccer team and we won something. Or what, what are all these things, and we have all these accolades, and we have all these things that we're, we're running towards. And he's saying, what, where is that for us? And he answers his question in verse 20. He says, for ye are the glory and the joy. And what Paul is saying here is it, it has nothing to do with this personal gain or this prideful uh, way of living. It's simply for you. It's for souls being saved. It's for people coming to the church, being discipled, being invested into and loving the church, and the church growing. And so we saw his anxiety, and now we're going to talk about Paul's ambassador to a mighty church. And the reason for sending this ambassador, the reason for sending Timothy, and Paul mentioned three specific reasons for sending sending Timothy to Thessalonica. The first you'll see in chapter uh, 3, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it uh, good to be left at Athens alone, Verse 2, and sent Timothy, our, fe- our brother and minister of God, and uh, our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are uh, appointed thereunto. And so he talks about there, he first says, to establish the believer. And Paul wanted uh, Timothy to go and understand that there was persecution taking place, and he wanted Timothy to be there to strengthen them up. He, he wanted them to kind of establish where their faith was. And in verse 3, it says, not to be moved by affliction. And, and so he's saying, Timothy, go. Timothy's coming to you. Timothy, go and take care of these people and strengthen them. You know, he wanted them to stand firm. He wanted them to be solid in their foundation. You know, it's sad to say, but some people give in to persecution. And and Pastor McInerney on Sunday said that this Bible, the Word of God, will one day be outlawed and will be persecuted for what it teaches. And it's saying, will we stand strong? Will we stand uh, uh, resilient for the Word of God? And again, back in Matthew 13, the, the, the parable of the rocky ground, again, we talked about the seed falls and it begins to grow and the, the roots don't grow deep and they don't have much to hold on to and the sun comes out and the rain stops and the wind begins to blow and it shrivels away and it dies because it had nothing to establish itself. And so as believers, we must establish ourselves. He sent Timothy also, number two, if you see in verse uh, two, it says, to establish and to comfort you. That word comfort means to encourage. They needed a pick-me-up. And sometimes isn't that nice to have a friend or a family member or a loved one or uh, somebody just walking along the street and they encourage you somehow, they lift you up? Persecution brings pain and suffering. And Paul wanted Timothy to, to bring some comfort to the people here in Thessalonica. He he wanted them to kind of encourage them. And so I begin to think about these these different things of of what the pandemic has done. And as servants of God, 
at, with our pastor and our staff and church members, where have what has happened? We've been essentially allowed to, churches have been closed down and we haven't been able to be open. And now we've been open for weeks and weeks and months. And we still have people that aren't coming because they've got comfortable with the way their life was. Because when you really look at their life, they weren't rooted deeply into the church. They weren't rooted deeply into their faith. And the third reason he sends Paul is he sends Paul to inquire concerning the believer. He sends Timothy to gather information, to bring back to him, to tell him how the church is doing, to tell him what is going on uh, in, in the Thessalonica church. He, he wants to find out exactly what's happening because, again, Paul is uh, unavailable to be there. And so he wants uh, this return. He wants this, this information to be brought to him. Paul was concerned. But Paul was also concerned about all this, this time. He's gone to this church and missionary journey. He's built this church. He's preached and taught and discipled and cre- uh, developed leaders to be there. And he's been gone for a short time. And he's uh, kind of concerned about this labor, this investment that he's poured into. And, and so he's concerned. He wants to hear what's going on. He wanted a report of how everything was going. And so we see there, we see that... Um, we see that he's concerned and that he's ready for something. He's established. Uh, he wants to make sure the church is established. He wants to make sure that the church is encouraged. And he wants this information. And then we see the result of sending this ambassador, sending Timothy. And you look in verse 5, it says, for this, or verse 4, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest... By some means, the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now, when Timothy came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Verse 8, for now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. And so we see here that Timothy wants this information because he's saying, listen, I, I, I don't want this, this time, this effort, the blood, sweat, and tears, if you will, to go in vain. And so now we see the results. He's concerned, but then Timothy brings back amazing, encouraging results. He begins to write about this report, and as he hears back, he's probably thinking, he said, why, why was I even worried? Why was I even concerned? They were faithful They were standing strong. They were firm. And they were faithful to their love and support of Paul. He was afraid of maybe they would fall away because of false accusations against him. Maybe they would uh, fall away because of this deep persecution that would take place. But he finds out from Timothy, no, no, no. They have so much love for you, Paul. They have so much support for you that they're supporting one another. And this report brought great comfort to Paul. If you think about this, he's concerned. He can't get there. He can't get there to see his people. And he gets back this report that everything's going good. And it begins to make me think of this love that he has for these people and and the amount of time and investment that he's poured into their hearts. And and it makes me think back to our time. Again, I told you when we came here, uh, you know, there was a little bit of a Uh, hesitation because we were leaving family, we were leaving friends, we were leaving kind of everything that we knew, and we were coming to a new place. And of course, it took time and it took a little bit of adjustment, but eventually when we really fell into place, when we really allowed ourselves to pour into the ministry here and, and really for people to minister to us, we truly and utterly fell in love with the church. And I don't mean we, we love the building, but we didn't fall in love with the building. We didn't fall in love with the parking lot or the, the departments or the facilities or whatever. We fell in love with the people. And me and Rachel were talking about this the other night. We were talking about whenever it is, whenever the Lord calls us somewhere else, if it's ever his will, you know, it's going to be harder for us to leave Savannah than it was to leave our home in Ohio. But you ask why? Because our, our love is so deep for this church. And the same thing goes and for, this, for you. 
your love for this church, we see it every single Sunday and Wednesday and uh, on men's prayer and all these different activities, the love that you have for this church. But think about this encouragement that was brought to Paul by this encouraging report. And you know what, what you think, well, what's encouraging today? It's encouraging when Pastor McInerney, after uh, being here and, and spending time and effort and preparing messages, when, when people fill this building, that's encouraging. I'll tell you this right now, it's hard to, to teach in front of a camera. But when this building is full, when the Spirit is moving, man, that, that is encouragement to our pastor. When people are at the altar praying for our community, praying for our church, that's encouragement. That brings encouragement. And you think of some of Paul's missionary journeys. And think about some of the things that he had went through. Shipwreck. Beaten. The list goes on and on. And think about all these different things he'd been gone through. Long days. Right? Sleeping outside. Not having the greatest uh, accommodations. Probably going long time without food. And yet he's still serving the Lord. And, and so at this point, Paul, being in Corinth, trying to get to Thessalonica, is probably discouraged in some way. But he gets this report, and this immediately lifts him up. This immediately encourages him and says, wow, the church is still alive and well. Have you ever been discouraged before? And you've maybe got a, a, had a bad day at work, or you got a, a, a phone call that you weren't expecting, or you got some medical news that you weren't ready for. And you get discouraged, but then for some reason you get a text message or a phone call or a letter in the mail or a card that somebody just says, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. I don't know why the Lord put you on my heart today. I mean, that's an encouragement. That's a pick-me-up. You know, ministry can be tough. And I'm not just talking about full-time ministry. I'm talking about ministering as, as believers. Now, ministry is obviously tough for for our pastor and exhaustion and constantly going and going. And that's why we constantly need to be in prayer for him and lifting him up. And as a staff, that's our job. But ministering in general, just going through life is hard. And I can tell you this, that it's encouraging to me when, when people, you walk through the door and people immediately say, hey, it's great to see you. Been praying for you. I'm thankful for that. And so we see his Paul's anxiety where he's concerned. Then we see Paul sending the ambassador. Now we see Paul's ambition for the mighty church. Look at verse 9. It says, For what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect what is lacking in your faith. Now God himself, our Lord, Father, and our uh, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another the, uh, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Verse 13. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And so in the closing chapter here, in these last few verses, Paul prays. And Paul is praying to the Lord and thanking him for all that he was able to accomplish while he was with this church. But he's also very thankful for the accomplishments that they have continued to grow in. That their growth has continued. What was his desire for this church that was already known as a mighty church? The first thing is that they be equipped by the servants. By the servants coming and we see that in verse 9, for, for what thanks can we render un, uh, to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. And we see, we heard the joyous thanks for the growth that they had. But he didn't want them to stop. He didn't want them to hit a plateau and just kind of be okay. Because oftentimes as believers, we become complacent. We get to a place where like, oh, yep, I'm good. But we can't. We must continue to grow daily. He wanted to be there in person again to lift them up, to have that fellowship so he could perfect what was lacking in their faith. Faith is not to be stagnant. 
Faith is to continually grow all the time. The word perfect here does not speak of a moral perfection. It simply is responding to a, uh, a means to equip. He's wanting to perfect them, give them the, the, the tools that they need to equip them to continue to grow. Pastors are responsible to prepare believers to serve the Lord. As pastors, as staff members, as churchgoers, as Sunday school teachers, as deacons, trustees, we are, you are, responsible to prepare believers. They also, they, that they would be established before the Savior's coming. There are some things only God can do, and we understand that, but we, as believers, have to do our part. He enables us to do, to be what we should be. He gives us the tools and the talents and the abilities to do wonderful things for his glory. And Paul desired, uh, his desired purpose was that God may establish or establish their hearts. It also says unblameable, without fault. Paul desired the believers to also exhibit practical holiness, to live in their everyday life, to go out and to, whenever they went to the store or they went to uh, work or wherever they went, that they were living a testimony that was a living testimony of the gospel. And this is accomplished only as we yield to God, only as we put God at the foremost of our family, at the foremost of our work, at the foremost of our life. We don't allow sports and kids. We don't allow careers. We don't allow uh, money. We don't allow toys and all these different things to overtake us. We simply are yielding to the Father. And so in chapter 3, it mentions the coming of the Lord. And coming literally means presence. And he speaks of a time, this speaks of a time when the Lord will be present, will be with us, when he returns and this is talking about the, the moment that we see him and that we're in his presence. And I can tell you, uh, I am so excited and, and, and glad and know that I have the opportunity when I die, that I will be present with the Lord. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, and so I understand that, that there's no, there's no worry, there's no uh, sadness that takes place. Yes, I'll be sad for my family, but I will be present with the Lord. And so the question I have is, as we go into celebrating Easter, and we are going to be celebrating the empty tomb, we're going to be celebrating the, the resurrection of Jesus, and ultimately he's, he's going to come again. Are you ready for his return? But then if you look in verse 13, it talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. This refers to who have all gone before all that have been saved, all of the believers that have gone on before, they're going to be coming with him. These saints are going to be coming with him. It, it, the, the dead in Christ, right? The, the ones that are asleep will come with him. And I just begin to think about this and how we as a church can surround one another, that we can surround uh, our pastor, we can surround our church and love on one another. So my question to you and as I end this is if you had one word, if you could only use one word to describe your faith, what would it be? Would it be strong? Would it be wavering? Would it be solid? Would it be weak? You can fill in there, but where, where would you put that word in reference to describing your faith? Because it's really, really easy for us to say, I'm okay, I'm doing good. But yet, we understand that Christ died for us, and he sent us here with a purpose. And Paul is explaining this, that he loves the church, he loves the people, he wants nothing more to be with him and fellowship with him, but he's so encouraged by the report. And so my question to you is this, are you continuing day in and day out to live for the Lord? No matter what way the world is, no matter what the news says, are you still living for him every day? And I would encourage you, this is a great opportunity if you have someone uh, in your family, uh, in your community, neighborhood, coworkers, this is a great opportunity for Easter as we get that ready in just a couple weeks to invite them to church, to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ, to hear about his resurrection, 
And I pray that you can do that. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you, Lord. I'm thankful for this story. I'm thankful for Paul. I'm so thankful for, Lord, his love for your people. And the, that he was willing to do whatever it took. And even though he couldn't get there, he was still praying for them. And he, he sent Timothy to be there with him. And then Timothy brings back such a positive report because they're continuing to love you, but also to love and support Paul. And Lord, I pray that we can do that with our pastor. Lord, that we can lift him up. Lord, that we can pray for him. And not only staff uh, wise, but that all the members of our church and the people can surround him and lift him up and hold his hands high, and take those burdens and weights away from him, Lord, that we can take care of. But Lord, I pray that you would be with us now, and Lord, I do pray for Palm Sunday, I pray for Easter, and I pray for all these uh, people that can come, and Lord, I pray for um, uh, amazing amounts of lost souls to be here, that we would have the opportunity to present the gospel to them. And Lord, I pray that you give the boldness and encouragement uh, to our people to go out and to invite. Lord, we love you and we thank you, in your name we pray. Amen. I hope to see you this Sunday, and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your week. God bless.